It's a great pleasure now to hand over to Professor John Barr. And John is a friend of mine, uh, honoured to call him a friend, but he is uh, one of the uh, leading uh, global pioneers into social priming research and the behaviour and function of the unconscious mind. John is going to uh, illuminate us with a scholarly precision and, because he's a very humorous man, a great deal of um, <laughs> light humour and fun along the way. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Professor John Barr. not the only one here with a tie. <laughs> this is the uniform of my university. If we want to be radical and casual, we unbutton the top button. <laughs> so I'm being all rad and cool. Uh, thank you, Simon, the fantastic uh, introduction to the whole day. And I look forward to these uh, talks after mine. I'm sure you do, too, um, uh, because I'm, I'm just going to learn so much. Uh, here's uh, my little introduction. Uh, here at, uh, here at Oxford, exactly a century ago, 1919, uh, this man entered Queen's College at Oxford, did so well in philosophy, was named a lecturer in 1925, fought in World War II, and came back to be the Wayne Fleet prof Professor of Metaphysics, and his name is, uh, was Gilbert Ryle. Gilbert Ryle coined the famous phrase, the ghost in the machine. He, uh, Gilbert Ryle was a, a philosopher, but he was a behaviorist. And for the first half or more uh, of the uh, 20th century, behaviorism domin dominated academic and, and uh, uh, um, empirical psychology uh, to the point where uh, it took until 1967, and even after that, really, about 10 years, before we academic psychologists who are interested in studying and researching human psychology were allowed to study the mind. If you don't know that, I, I, I find that absolutely shocking and, and uh, horrible because at the same time, the other sciences were making great leap forward in the early 20th century physics, chemistry, and so forth. We were not even allowed to study our natural subject matter. And I mean weren't allowed. You'd not get a job. You wouldn't uh, get a degree. Uh, behaviorists dominated the field. It took people like Ulrich Neisser and Noam Chomsky in the 1960s to foment a cognitive revolution. Uh, and uh, Nicer, one of my heroes, uh, wrote the first book, Cognitive Psychology, in 1967. He wrote it in Harvard in William James Hall in the, very, in the, the basement, a little cubbyhole room in the basement of William James Hall, the very building that B.F. Skinner, the famous behaviorist, had the entire 12th floor. <laughs> they saw each other in the elevator once in a while, never spoke to each other. But right under Skinner's nose, the manifesto of the cognitive revolution was being written and basically overthrew behaviorism finally. It took a while for all those tenured behaviorist professors to leave their posts in the 80s and 90s. It really wasn't until 1990 that they were pretty much all gone. What that means is that we really haven't been studying the mind very long in psychology as a science. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about is some of the uh, scientific systematic investigations with average people, not uh, Freud's uh, uh, people who are suffering from mental disorders or emotional disorders, and very few of them at that. But the average person with uh, control conditions and assigned to different conditions, uh, random assignment, and all those nice features of scientific uh, practice, and falsifi falsifiable hypotheses as well. But that all started in the 19, uh, 1970s. Now, to his great credit, Nicer recognized that Ryle had a point, that it was a homunculus to say, oh, well, everything's in, uh, the conscious mind is in charge and, and determining what we do and looking at this and looking at that for its own purposes, but not specifying how that conscious mind worked. And he said, one of our, the, the final chapter on executive processes, he said, this is where all the control is now. It's not in the environment. It's not like Skinner said. It's not in the world. Stimulus response links. 
It's in our head, it's in our goals, it's in our motives. We have control, we have ch uh, charge, but that's still a homunculus driving the, driving the car from inside the head. Our job is to reduce the size of that homunculus as much as possible, to find out what the mechanisms are and the machines are and the devices are and how it operates so we can reduce as much as possible this unknowable uh, metaphysical homunculus that Ryle was, uh, had a point. So interestingly, today we have a talk uh, this afternoon by, by Professor Roberts, The Mind of a Machine, and another way to think of my talk this morning is I'm going to be talking about the machines of the mind, because that's what we've uncovered in the last 40 years, not just my lab, but many, many others, is what are the automatic mechanisms or the unconscious mechanisms that uh, the human mind, especially the human social mind, operates under, and once we know about those mechanisms, can we put them to effective use in society? Can we put them into effective use, more effective use in the classroom? Certainly politicians are already doing that. They make us afraid, that makes us more conservative. They make us uh, feel safer. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. We become more liberal. Advertisers are doing this all the time. They've been doing it for about 15 years. They are directly influencing our behavior through priming, through other methods, through nudges and budges, but they are definitely influencing us for their ends. Now, at the end, I was going to say something about the ethics of everything I'm going to propose to you because it is manipulating your, your, your children, your students, and so forth. And, may, and they may not realize how they're being manipulated. But the reason I think this is OK is because we're all on the same team here. We have shared goals. Organizations are using priming. Organizations are using these techniques right now. Uh, to increase uh, productivity of their workers, to increase customer satisfaction of customers uh, in, in stores because of the way that their uh, sales clerks uh, behave. To, this, to the extent that we have shared interests and shared goals within an organization, you're part of the team, you're, you're helping to make profits, you're helping to the business do better, same thing in the, in the classroom, to the extent you're all buying into the same goals, this is okay. This is not giving somebody nudges and budges towards something that's against their self-interest. This is for their self-interest and is part of the contract of their participation in the educational system. So I really don't think there's any ethical problem, but we can talk about that. But, as I said, other agents such as politicians and advertisers and businesses and corporations and Google and everybody else are already using them. And they're not telling you about that. So these are the internal uh, machines of the mind, thanks to Charlie Chaplin in modern times. And these are unconscious psychological mechanisms that I discuss at great at, it's at some length, but all of them are in, in my book. But I wanted to feature some, I think, of the most important ones. How these work in general, and the, the book is organized this way in terms of the past, the present, and the future, but really, the body is always in the physical present. The mind is not. The mind is often in the past. The mind is often influenced by past, your early childhood history, very, very influential later on. You have no explicit memory for those years. And yet it influences you in, in dramatic ways. Evolutionary uh, motives and drives that uh, are operating and, and causing you to have political beliefs and abstract social attitudes without you realizing that's the real source of them. Uh, and also the future, your goals and motives. Your mind is participating in the future even though your body is in the present. You're thinking about the future. You're thinking about what you're going to do. And those motives and goals influence how you like or dislike things in your present. Are they good for the goal or not? And depending on that, it guides your behavior in the present. So starting with the past, there are about four or five basic primal motivations. Reproduction is, is, is certainly one of them, and I'm not including that here. Focusing on instead how to establish cooperation, everybody being on the same page, cooperation with your goals in the classroom, the students being on board with the project, participating willingly, uh, and so forth. How do you establish that? Another that I may not get to, but I would love to talk about, if there's time, but also questions and answer, uh, question and answer period is influences on safety and survival, because a lot of times students are under threat. They're being bullied or they're threatened by their uh, academic uh, identity that's maybe not so stable. Maybe their group is not known to be very good academically, and they buy into this called stereotype, stereotype threat. There's lots of threats to students in the classroom and outside the classroom. How can we help that? And that's uh, maybe I can get to if we have time. But right now, I'd like to focus on establishing, helping to establish, using these unconscious mechanisms cooperation, uh, and uh, having the shared goal in the classroom. 
Now, it turns out cooperation most, is the most recent, uh, it's like a new planet that's been discovered by astronomers. Cooperation is the latest and newest evolved primal motivation uh, discovered for, for human beings, along with safety and survival uh, and, uh, and reproduction and uh, resource seeking, such as uh, for uh, uh, food and shelter and, and that kind of thing. But there's only four or five of them. Well, cooperation is an innate uh, goal that even little kids uh, show. But it requires some ingredients. It's not just there. Uh, little infants don't and toddlers don't cooperate and bond with everybody. They, they are very much uh, looking to stay with their families, to stay with the ones they know. So it's not just they are going to help everybody and want to be with everybody. They don't trust everybody. They trust their group. They trust their, their family. They trust those they're bonded to. Now, I came uh, This uh, is a Dalai Lama uh, tweet from uh, just a few weeks ago. There was one after this. I just couldn't get into the talk in time that was even better. But the Dalai Lama is basically laying out this, uh, this chain of what I'm talking about, this causal chain. You just have to run it in reverse. Uh, what's important is trust. Where does trust come from? Trust is not for everybody. Even little kids don't trust everybody. They trust those they are friends with. They trust those they have bonded with. And from that bond comes cooperation. Now, here's a... a, a a study that's indicative of these kinds of effects. This is a wonderful study coming from the Max Planck uh, Th Michael Tomasello lab in Leipzig by his students. Children 18 months old, so one and a half year olds, are shown a series of 16 uh, color slides of toys. In this case, the toy is a red plastic tea kettle. For each of the slides, depending on their condition of the study, and they're randomly assigned to the different conditions, A, B, C, or D, in the upper right-hand corner of each slide are two figures. Now, it could be, as in A, two dolls with orientation towards each other in a friendly, sort of close way, or it could be the two dolls facing apart, or it could be colorful things that aren't dolls, or it could just be one doll. There's the different conditions. After they see these slides, the experimenter comes with the next thing to do, uh, which is a, a game or toy to play with. It's a bunch of sticks, I think. And oops, drops them on the way to the child at the table. The variable here is, does the child help? Does the 18-month-old who can toddle around get up and walk over to help pick up the sticks? The experimenter gives that chance, gives them a chance to do so without asking for help. So this is the key variable, spontaneous helping, spontaneous cooperating, trying to help the experimenter. In B, C, and D, one out of five times the child helps, 20%, B, C, and D. In A, 60%, three out of five. The only difference is whether they had those two dolls in a bonded kind of friendly orientation or not, priming with dolls with 18-month-olds who know nothing about the world very much. It means it's innate. It means it's there pretty much at birth. And it means that this bond, a sign of a bond, even a symbolic one like this, is sufficient to dramatically increase cooperation in very young children who haven't really learned much about the world, but it's there to be primed. It's an innate, evolved motivation. And it's not for everything, right? They don't cooperate all the time, but if there's a sign of a bond, they, the idea in their head, they're just as bonded with the experimenter as, any, as uh, with anybody else in all the four conditions. The only difference is the dolls. So how do you establish this bond of trust? Now, of course, you can do things and show you're trustworthy and all that. I'm talking about the unconscious mechanisms that, that would uh, help produce trust. And as Simon uh, uh, began, with the, uh, began in his uh, opening remarks, there's certainly a lot of contagion out there. there's certainly we're certainly influenced by the behavior of other people in ways we don't realize. We're just as much uh, like herds of antelope or schools of fish or flocks of bird in this regard. You know, Fred Bird doesn't look over at Sally Bird and say, "Oh, Sally's going that way. Hmm, I think I will too." You know, Fred's not thinking about this and making a conscious decision with slow processing. It's immediate. It's a perception behavior link. Uh, yeah, I don't know about this. Maybe cats. I have three cats. I don't think they cooperate. They, they, don't, they don't imitate very much. But, but we do. People do. 
And we do it big time. You ever had two or three year olds, you know, you do something, they'll do it. Even if it's something dumb, I dropped uh, hot coal on my deck uh, the other uh, last summer. Uh, and I didn't know it. It fell out of the bottom of the grill, and I stepped out with my bare foot, and yeah! And our two-year-old grandson is there, yeah! And then he's going, yeah, for the next week. He's going, ho goes home, and I, I hear he's going, yeah, in Indiana, you know, a, a thousand miles away for the next two weeks. Like, you know, they don't know what is right or what is wrong, and since this was memorable, he just decided this is what people should do, is go, yeah, all the time. <laughs> Two-year-olds really do this. They're soaking up what's the right thing to do. They don't know. They're soaking up like crazy from the adults around them and their, and their peers and their uh, siblings what is the right thing to do. Well, at NYU 20 years ago, Tanya Chartrand and I uh, did some studies on this, and we called it the chameleon effect basically because in our study where they participated in a task on a table and there was another person there, purportedly another participant, but really a confederate, really part of our experimental team, and they were working together. But the Confederate either, and there were two Confederates, one uh, sort of uh, touched her face and pulled on her ear in sort of a nervous manner. The other one didn't do that, but shook her, uh, was sitting down, legs crossed, and shaking her foot in a nervous manner. I, I, my lab tells me this is what I do all the time, all of these things at once. So they took part of it and made one person do one part and the other person do the other part, and we just videotaped to see what the actual participant did, and they you know, touched their face and so forth with the face rubbing, face-touching person, stopped doing that when they moved to the other person and started shaking their foot instead. Like a chameleon, matching the background, matching the, uh, matching, uh, the, the context that they're in. Well, the nice result of this is that there's a reason why people do this, and it's a very nice thing, and can be used in the classroom, can be used and is being used in organizations, that this natural mimicry actually creates uh, greater liking and bonding uh, between people. So we ran another study, and now the Confederate was uh, asked to, in one condition, to take on, try to be a mirror image of the person by the body language and whatever they were doing, try to be as much of a mirror image of the person, imitate them, or not. Afterwards, we asked the actual participant how much they liked that other person they were in the experiment with and how thought... Uh, the, how, how much they thought the interaction went smoothly and so forth. And they liked the person more if that imitation had been going on and they thought the interaction had gone more smoothly if that had happened. So it's sort of a natural bonding here with the imitation and mimicry. You can see where I'm going with this. But it's actually been tested out in the field. Waitresses in a, a large Dutch study uh, were just told to repeat back the person's orders uh, just when they were taking the orders at a restaurant. So I'd like uh, hamburger, chips, and uh, a milkshake, please. You'd like hamburger, chips, milkshake. Or they didn't do that. And that's all they did, were told to do it or not, randomly assigned and so forth. The tips at the end were significantly higher if they had just repeated back the order. So if any of you have a, you know, a, a, a night job, uh, <laughs> it works. It, it works in department stores. This is a large French department store electronics MP3 section of a large French department store. Uh, and what they did here was just repeat back what the person was saying in a, in a, in a nice, you know, subtle way. Oh, hi, uh, can I help you, sir? Yes, I'm looking for an MP3 player for my grandson. He's turning 13 next week. Oh, I see, your grandson's having a birthday next week. You'd like an MP3 player for your grandson. Something like that, or not. And they, again, randomly assigned a condition, not knowing what was going on in the study. Sales of the MP3 players went something like 63% of the contacts in the control condition, 87% in the mimicry condition, and customer satisfaction went up like 15 or 20%. And all the difference was was those two things. They, they followed these people out to the uh, parking lot afterwards and asked them what, about their experience in the store and imitation. Now, are they saying, oh, this person imitated me. I'll buy the MP3 player. No. It's like they feel they like the person. They feel a, a bond with that person. They feel they can trust the salesperson not to sell them a piece of you know what. And the same thing with the waitress. Oh, she imitated my order. I'll give her a bigger tip. No. I liked the way, the way they're misattributing, misunderstanding where the feeling is coming from and thinking it's because of the service, the quality of the service, the friendly time they had, and they want to reward that. So the, the reason for the feeling is not known to people, but the feeling is there, and the feeling is attributed to something that results in these kinds of effects. I just want to point out, 
when I wrote my book, I couldn't say this because at the time it was, it was top secret. And I was told, but, but I was told by people in the FBI uh, who were agents in the FBI that, by the way, your work in the 1990s on the chameleon effect was picked up by the FBI and other law enforcement uh, interrogation services like, I guess, the CIA and other ones in the United States. And so they started using this imitation and mimicry to create bonding and rapport with the, with the people they were interrogating. And they said, this gets much better information. They get quality information, torture and things like that, unfortunately. Comey was overruled when, when he was working in the, 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 the State Department and the FBI. It was overruled by Bush and Cheney, and they have Abu Ghraib and all this torture stuff because they insisted that's how you got good information. So that information is garbage. They'll tell you anything you want to know to get out of being tortured. Of course, as, as I would. Whatever you want to know, here, I'll tell you, you know, I'll make it up. You don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll say, you know. Now, Comey, the reason I'm selling you this now is, and it's standard use in the FBI and intelligence services now, and rapport and bonding increases the accuracy and the, and the forthcomingness of people being interrogated. So they use it all the time. It works much better. All they do is mimic. mimic they, they imitate, they, they uh, get to the same level of language, you know, not using a more abstract or, or sophisticated level of language. They try to be as much as possible like the person, and it really works. And the FBI agent was telling me, we're using this all the time in the FBI, but you can't tell anybody because it's top secret. Well, then, Comey's book, he says it. <laughs> Thank you, James Comey. He actually says, and I've got the page where he says this is what they do, and they, it works much better than torture, and why he was arguing against torture. So it's now that Comey said it, I can say it. It's no, it can't be that top secret if it's in his best-selling book, right? <laughs> but it's nice to hear, you know, and nice to know that that's what they were doing. They picked up on this effect, and they're actually using it, just like the department stores and just like uh, uh, restaurants. So if you want to just naturally do this in the classroom, it's very simple. You, for one thing, you can repeat back what the child is saying, what the student is saying, if you can, when you're talking to them. And also, to create this sort of natural bonding that, that happens just by your own, remember, your role here as far as mimicking and imitating them, just pay attention to them. This is just a general rule I tell everybody in every talk. The simplest way to make a good, help make a good impression on new people, acquaintances, neighbors, colleagues, whoever it is, is during your interaction, just look at them. Just look at them. It's a perceptual effect that is natural and automatic, but it requires you to perceive and look at them. Now, if you're like me, you know, when I'm meeting somebody new, I'm thinking uh, inside, and my attention is focused internally, and I'm thinking about, oh, the you know, clever thing I'm going to say, the witty thing I'm going to say next, you know, and I'm thinking about that and not paying attention to them, and I miss their name half the time, right? Because I'm so focused inwardly on what my next thing is going to be, and I'll, whatever, or, or I'm self-conscious. Instead, just pay attention, just perceive them. If you perceive them, you'll naturally mimic and imitate them, as the studies show. They'll pick that up and like and bond with you more. All you got to do is look at them. All you got to do is pay attention to them. It works great. And with children, same thing. You can just pay attention to them. Also, repeating back what they say uh, in, a, in a subtle way. Not so obvious, but in a subtle way. There are other ways to establish bonding and trust that are, again, wired in. Physical warmth is a big one. And I don't think I have time to get into this, but maybe later or lunchtime, if you want to ask me about it, there's incredible stuff going on right now in the mental health field with physical warmth. And it may be something that can be used uh, in the classroom. Um, get, grab me and ask me about that if I don't get to it today. John Bowlby was... Um, you probably all know John Bowlby, a developmental, uh, very famous uh, English uh, psychologist, wrote the tremendous book, Attachment and Attachment and Loss. There's two or three in the series, I think, around 1970. He's really the, the father of modern relationship research in psychology. And he's the one who, who pointed out the importance of attachment between parent and child, especially mother and child, because of breastfeeding. And he said, now, in every child, in every mammal, child. Can mammals? Every mammal offspring. Uh, breastfeeding causes a conflation in the mind of the little one between the feelings of physical warmth and sensations of physical warmth and the feeling of social warmth. The feeling that this person, you can trust, I can trust this person, they have my back, they're taking care of me, they're feeding me, and they will watch over me and, and, and keep me safe. That's social, that's social warmth. 
Social coldness is the opposite, that the, you, this person betrays even close people. Now that means there's a connection between physical warmth and social warmth. And Bowlby in 1969, 1970 basically said, he basically made the prediction that this should be hardwired in the human mind because it's gonna be part of experience going back millions of years. Harry Harlow with those you know, monkey studies, I don't know if you ever had to watch those movies of the poor little monkeys raised in isolation. Uh, taken away from their mother at birth, raised in isolation for the next year. They either had a wire mother or a cloth mother. The wire mother provided milk and the thing there at the top, the cloth mother is what they preferred to be with. And everyone said, oh, it's the cloth, it's the tactile comfort of the cloth, you know, the piece of rug, piece of carpet. After a year, they were put back uh, with the other monkeys, and they were all, you know, raised uh, with their parents and siblings, and they were all having crazy monkey fun. Did this poor little monkey raised in isolation join in the monkey fun or not? The ones raised with the wire monkey did not. They huddled in the corner, held themselves, rocked. It was pathetic. It was very sad. The other ones who had the cloth mother were okay. They were great. You know, but they were functional. They, they could actually try and get in, and you know, they could try. Now, they were still raised in isolation, but they had the cloth mother. What you don't hear about, when you hear about this study, what they don't tell you, they didn't tell me back then, was there's a 100-watt light bulb behind that piece of carpet. They had, for that year, a source of physical warmth in the absence of social warmth. And there's a connection, it turns out, between physical warmth and social warmth, as Bowlby predicted, that gave them at least some social warmth, that allowed them to have some kind of trust, that allowed them to have some kind of social skill and, and ability to be with others. Just the physical warmth. Here's a study Hans Eisermann, who's now at Grenoble, uh, did with uh, preschool children, uh, three-year-olds, in Holland. The, day, the preschool, they were uh, like a daycare kind of situation. And they had lots of things. Now, they were given stickers. Now, these kids love stickers. They, you know, kids love it. SpongeBob or I don't know what, you know, My Little Pony. And, but they love stickers. They were given stickers. Some of them were asked to, or just given something to hold for a little bit. It was either a cold thermos or a warm thermos. The kids who randomly assigned the condition, the kids who held the warm thermos shared and gave away more of their stickers to the other kids, three-year-olds. The feeling of physical warmth caused them to be more generous, more socially warm towards others. Since 2007, we did a study with coffee, hot coffee, cold coffee. People had more warm feelings of others after briefly holding a hot coffee, just handed to them for a second, then a cold cup of coffee. We didn't know, Bowlby didn't know, Harlow didn't know that there'd be neuroscience on this that followed in the last 10 years. And it's shown brain imaging, that the same tiny part of the human insula, which is a walnut-shaped part of the brain right in the middle, a junction box of sorts, the same little part becomes active when they hold something warm as when they're texting their family and friends, as when they're holding or touching, or having a physical warmth experience, as when they're having a socially warm experience. They're both active. They're that connected. Bowlby was really right, but it's hardwired in the human brain. And many studies have followed this up. And I just want to give some credit to this guy, who's not Satan, no. <laughs> to, and not even Gustav Dore, I want to give credit to Dante. Because in Dante's Inferno, where the punishment fits the crime, and there's nine levels of hell, all the way down to level nine, the worst people, the worst level, level nine, where Satan is, what did they do? What do they do so bad that they're in level nine? Level seven is murderers. These are murderers, and there are seven. Five is lawyers. <laughs> what did these people do? They betrayed the trust of, of friends. They betrayed the trust of people who trusted them. Not just people, you know, fraudulent with strangers. They betrayed the trust of people who trusted them. Satan is chewing on the head of Judas Iscariot in level nine, and his other hand has the guy who betrayed Dante and sent Dante into exile. Wow. The two worst people in the history of the world, according to Dante. What's their punishment? In the midst of fiery hell, it's to be frozen in ice. 
for all eternity in the middle of fiery hell. The punishment for social coldness of betraying somebody who trusted you is to be physically cold, frozen in ice forever. The souls were strewn like leaves through the ice. So we have a fork in the road here. I want to talk about both of these. I want to take both for both paths because they're, I think, both, both important for, under, for helping uh, uh, do things, do positive things in the classroom. One is to talk more about contagion effects, as Simon did, and then come back and talk about other kinds of priming effects that you can use in the classroom. And I, I look at the titles of the talks coming up today, and there's uh, one on feedback. And uh, feedback is uh, one of the last studies I'll talk about that's done in organizational psychology. But let's finish up with contagion effects and then move over and talk about other kinds of priming effects you might be able to use uh, to the class's benefit. Now, what you see is what you do. There's a lot of really interesting research on this. Uh, field studies such as, again in Holland, a, a science magazine paper from 2008. Signs of disorder like graffiti cause other kinds of social disorder and disobedience. So what they do is they, they have a street here with the graffiti and people parking their bikes. And they uh, use a rubber, uh, a rubber band and put a pamphlet on the handlebars of all the bikes you know, for some ad for something. They just wanted to see how many people took those and threw them on the ground and littered. Or did they carry them all the way to the end of the street, the alley, and put them in the uh, receptacle? The condition was just, was there graffiti on the wall, sign of social disobedience and, and vandalism, if you will? Or not. So there, what they did was they did the study with the graffiti, which was already there, and then they painted the wall and did the study again. And there was significantly less littering, social disorder, in the clean, no graffiti condition than in the uh, graffiti condition. So one form of social disorder, seeing what other people did. Now, so this is a, an interesting form of contagion because you don't actually see anybody doing anything. You see the remnants or signs that someone had done something. And even at that level, the idea of this vandalism, this, this obedience, social disorder, um, dirt, or whatever you want to call it, was active and influenced the person's own behavior. It was more okay for them to do this uh, disorder thing too. Uh, this is also called broken windows theory, that if you enforce the small stuff, it actually causes decreases in crime at the, the more severe crime levels. That's a field study again, not a laboratory experiment. Nick Fowler and Jim Christakis have written books on this. They've done so many studies on this. But they look at social networks, people who know each other, like in Framingham, Massachusetts, in a giant study of, uh, of uh, heart patients uh, who know each other. And then that person knows somebody. And so, in that, and so they trace in these networks who knows who. And what they find in all of these studies is that what, hap what, what somebody does three or four levels removed from you makes it more likely you'll do the same thing. More likely you'll have the same characteristic. For example, more likely you'll have an, be an alcoholic if they are. More likely you'll be obese if they are. More likely you'll be depressed. More likely you'll be happy. More likely you'll be uh, uh, so forth as cooperative. They have study after study on this. Now, these are people you don't even know, right? But they know somebody who knows somebody who knows you. And so the only way this can happen is their behavior is contagious to those around them, which is so forth and so on. It goes at least three or four levels deep. Obesity. This is the heart study for 25 years of data with all these people. Drinking and problem drinking in that study. And here's a study that Simon mentioned a little while ago. The, uh, the 2014 Facebook study done by Kramer and, and associates who worked for Facebook, 700,000, this is one part of it, 700,000 Facebook users. Your newsfeed was de deliberately manipulated to be either 20% more positive than usual or 20% less. And the way they do that is by coding the words used, uh, just coding the, the syntax and the actual vocabulary used in posts. In terms of positivity or negativity, there's ways to do that online that's very common, commonly used uh, by sophisticated uh, apps and so forth and, and websites. So they can take that, code each post. Now, you never see all the posts that you could from your friends. There's just too many of them. So they're always filtered. And what they did was take the ones that existed and shape them so they were either more or less pos more positive or more negative than usual. 
Then they coded what you did over the next three, four, five days. What are your posts like? Your posts are more positive if you were exposed to 20% more positive posts four days earlier. Your posts are more negative. So the, the post, the content, the mood of the post that you read affects your behavior and makes it more negative or positive in line. And that's a gigantic study, of, and they've done more than that, of course. But certainly we are influenced. Our emotions are influenced. Our behavior is influenced. Even things like obesity, drinking, and, and so forth, depression are influenced by people we don't even know but are connected to over social networks. And here's my little thing. I know that this is a, it's an issue. Uh, Chromebooks, uh, phones, and things like that are an issue with students. I just want to say they're getting it anyway. They always did get it. This is Durkheim's suicide book. He talks about a copycat suicides in 1897 in the, in the prisons of France and other places. When one person did it, it was more likely other people did it. And this kind of copycat thing has been around for a long time. Uh, it's, it's certainly there already with, uh, with advertisements. Uh, people, uh, uh, advertisers, uh, for example, we already knew this existed. Uh, uh, since I was I just found out about it from an actual company that engages in this, and they've been doing it since 2004 or five at least. And what they're doing with their ads a lot of the time is trying to get you, prime you to behave a certain way while you watch the ad at home. They're not just trying to get you to remember Sudzo soap, so you go to the store and buy Sudzo. Oh, here's Sudzo, I'll buy Sudzo. It's not just that, it's the old fashioned idea of advertising. This is actually trying to get you to behave at home to eat more or drink more or consume more of whatever it is so that you'll have to buy more at the store the next day. Consume more. How do you do this? Through these ads, showing people drinking, showing people eating. So we've run studies where people watch little snippets of television shows and we put in, uh, we insert either food ads or non-food ads. And if there was a food ad, we have a bowl of goldfish crackers and a thing of water. We weigh the bowl of goldfish crackers either before, you know, before and then after the study so we know how much they ate in weight of the goldfish, 45% more in this study if there were food ads. They ate 45%. This is also, this, we did the study with eight-year-olds. Same effect as adults. The food ads, it didn't matter what kind of food it was. It wasn't just snacks like potato chips or things like that. It was any kind of food ad where people are eating. The idea of eating is active and you're mindlessly watching television perhaps just to relax and it's very easy for these kinds of behaviors then to occur. And it is problematic with alcohol ads. Uh, a lot of times, uh, preteens uh, in, in, uh, or teens who are uh, not uh, legally allowed to, to drink yet in the United States watch sporting events with their parents. There's a lot of beer ads, a lot of alcohol ads on these like Sunday afternoon football games or baseball or whatever it is. Uh, and you think, oh, well, you know, advertising doesn't affect me, doesn't make me do anything. Well, you can believe that if you want. But, you know, as parents, we have some, we have some responsibility for our children. And in this study, the number of ads they were exposed to uh, on average per month dramatically uh, affected how much they drank. Now, these are, children, these are teenagers who at least have one drink a month, not kids who don't drink at all. So they have already the goal inside their head or the motive and behavior to drink. For those that were, not, were exposed to no ads, no alcohol ads per month, the average five drinks a month. To those who saw the most ads, that group, 30 drinks a month. So if they have their propensity and they, they already have the drinking thing going, the ads dramatically up to six times increase how much they drink. And I would think that the people with the ads know this effect because they're increasing consumption of their product in these ways. So, all this contagion going on, there is something that you can control, and that's you. Because you are definitely contagious to your students and to your, your uh, co-workers and colleagues. And actually, studies in the Florida, uh, University of Florida Business School has shown this, that the, how, the, how the instructor of a class reacted to somebody who came in the class late by making a big deal out of it and, and, and dressing them down and saying how you're never going to succeed in life if you're not on time and this kind of stuff going on and on you know, really rude to this person who came in late. Maybe they shouldn't have come in late, but they were very rude. The, the, the rudeness of the rest of the class increased, increased for some time. Rudeness of a negotiation partner on one class session uh, one week carried over to two or three weeks more into the semester from one person to the next. So rudeness in the workplace, rudeness in the classroom and all that is definitely 
uh, contagious, but uh, so are positive things. But uh, it, it, the leader of the group has a very powerful role uh, in terms of the contagion and spreading of that behavior. So what you do is dramatically going to affect what the, what the students do. So now, that's done with contagion, now other uh, environmental priming effects. How do you deliver primes? How do you deliver primes that influence behavior of, of, of the children, of the students in your classrooms? One is context. Because we can be a very different person in one setting or the other. This is not necessarily about my, my mom. <laughs> But people can be different in one place or another. This is a wonderful study from Holland. The silence of the library. They were, the students were told to take a, a note or a, a packet of paper to one of three destinations on their campus at a Dutch university, the gym, uh, the um, uh, head of the, the, the president's office, or the library. And they had on them, uh, secretly, they were, video, they were um, audio recorded. And they talked more quietly when they were on the way to the library than the other two destinations. They weren't in the library. They had library on the mind because that was their destination. But the idea of library, pros primed, was active. And the norms and behavior when a person is in the library became active. They were not physically in the library yet, they were psychologically in the library, and they did what you do in the library, and that's talk more quietly. So the context can have an effect separately even from being in that context, but that shows, uh, that shows a direct effect of the activated idea of, of the location. Famous study now by Ernst Fair at the University of Zurich, who's a, a behavioral economist, and this was a study of investment bankers in Zurich at the big banks like UBS and Credit Suisse and so forth. Big problem in the, the banking, investment banking industry is rogue investors who do unethical, immoral things and get their company in big trouble. Sometimes they go out of business because of these uh, cheaters and, and rogue investors. He wanted to study, well, you know, maybe it's that these investors, they, they are cheating pre people. They're bad people. They're immoral people. And that's why they become investment bankers, right? They're self-selected into the profession. That is one possibility. And that was raised and discussed at the time. These things happen. Or it's something to do about the norms of the workplace. So what Ernst Fair did and his colleagues was email uh, a lot of investment bankers. He has the cooperation in all these studies of the investment banks themselves. So they make their employees available, their investment bankers available to him for research. He emails them on a Saturday morning and says, OK, we're going to play this uh, game. And the game is just to flip a coin uh, 20 times and just tell us how many heads uh, you flipped. And you'll get whatever, 20, Euro, 20 Swiss francs for every successful heads. No one's going to know. No one's looking at you. You can just say whatever you want. Know. What do you do? Now, interestingly, the left side panel is what the control condition did. And that's just what I just described. They flipped the coin and they reported. It turns out their self-reports of how many coins they flipped corresponded to what you'd expect by chance. It almost matched the binomial theorem of what you'd expect just by chance alone. Sure, there were some people who had more than usual. There were also people who had less than usual, and they mostly clustered around the middle. It didn't differ from the, what you'd expect by chance. So they were actually scrupulously honest in that condition. Not so for the people on the right. And all, the only difference, and again, randomly assigned to condition, the only difference on the people on the right was they were asked to, to describe uh, their physical workplace, what was their office like, uh, describe what it looked like, you know, the windows, the desks, the layout, whatever. It put their mind in their work environment. It triggered their work environment, and it also triggered the goals and the values and the standards. They became more immoral, they became more greedy, and they overreported. Oh, lucky me. <laughs> 10 out of 10 heads. Oh, gee, my lucky day. Yeah, 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 right. So, uh, but that's interesting because it's the context the environment, the situation that is where the, those goals are located. And they are actually a different person with fairly moral values uh, when not in that environment, or at least not thinking, when their head's not in that environment. Even physically, they, they, cannot, they may not be there, but if their mind is there, they will be like the people on the right. I love this next one. It's very, very powerful. It's uh, surprisingly how, how powerful this is, and that's the personal identities. Now, your, your students, your uh, uh, people, your students in the class 
have more than one identity. Student is one of them. They have ethnic identities. They may have racial identities. They have gender identities. Uh, they may have other kinds of identities. And they're very powerful. This is a study from Harvard, um, a shocking study, really, from now 20 years ago almost, of preschool uh, kids, five-year-olds. And these are Asian American girls. And they wanted to see how well they do in math. Well, interesting, in the United States, we have two different stereotypes that apply here. The Asian American stereotype in the United States is that they're better than average on math and science than the average student. But the female, the, the girl identity, is that they're worse than boys on math. And these are Asian American girls. Mm -hmm. What they did was they primed, before they took a math test, one or the other of those identities. They were randomly assigned to either color in a coloring page that had two girls playing with dolls, or uh, uh, two, two children, but with Asian uh, kinds of symbolic cultural things like chopsticks or whatever, tea kettles and things like that. So it was either Asian culture or it was girl. They colored it in. And then they were given an age-appropriate uh, age math test. And the ones who colored in the Asian cartoon did significantly better than all the other kids on the math test. And the ones who colored in the girl one did significantly worse. It's the same kid. It's the same child, randomly assigned to be this one or randomly assigned to be that one. If they were in the other condition, they would have done worse and so forth. It's both of them are in their heads. One says they're good at math, the other says they're not. Which identity was active caused to change in their math performance, their behavior, the cultural stereotype having an effect on a five-year-old's behavior. And I, when, this, when these results were announced at a conference in Nashville, the air just got sucked out of the room. We went, oh my God, because we had always counted on education. We had always counted, we'd get them in first grade, they're age six, and the teachers, you know, we can, we can get at them, we can change their minds, we can prevent these kinds of deleterious stereotype threat effects of the cultural stereotype, girls can't do math and science, it's too late. I'm not saying things can't help after age five, but it's already in their head to the extent that it automatically and unconsciously affects their behavior. They don't know that coloring in Asian or girl kinds of cartoons affects their math behavior. There's nothing that they know about this. Totally unconscious. But it's already there by age five because of the culture. That's the power of identity. Now these are cute. These are amazing effects by Brett Pelham. He's been doing these for like 10 years now. But showing effects of your name. People, you know, we all like our name, but we really like our name. We like it more than we think. We like our initials. We like our birthday. Kids really like their birthday. This is very important. My, my daughter's lucky number is 23, because she was born on February 23rd. And she's 23, and so, you know, this is her lucky number, and everything's so great. Why? Because this is an important part of your self-concept, and we all tend to think we're better than average. For the most part, we have a positive self-esteem and self-regard. So things that connect to ourself also are seen as positive. So you have people like named Ken are more likely to move to, to Kentucky. People named Laura are more likely to become a lawyer. This is uh, data from the English census also from the 1800s and 1900s, as well as the US. There's study after study after study that show these effects. No, they're not giant effects, but they are there and they are significant. It just shows merely having something that touches your self-concept. I, I don't even have slides up here. People are more likely to choose their wedding date uh, to have numbers in it from their respective birthdays or the month that they get married, things like that. Or to be more likely to marry somebody who shares these numbers and shares these things than what you'd expect from chance. But here's something. This was actually a study done in the New Haven Public Schools by two Yale researchers around 10 years ago. And they wanted to see if this identity priming effect would help increase math performance on underachieving high school math students in New Haven. Now, New Haven Public Schools are not great. They're, they're, they get F grades from the state. So there's a lot of underperforming math students in New Haven schools, and I think this was a high school. In October of a year, they went in, and they had uh, the students read a little uh, New York Times article. It looked just like a New York Times article. It was, it was faked up, mocked up, but it looked just like New York Times, uh, about a math award winner from another high school somewhere else, maybe in the country, 
little bio box in the upper right corner of that article had the person's name, had their hobbies, you know, and had their birthday, and had uh, something else, right? Just very innocuous. But the birthday was manipulated to be either the same birthday as the student reading it or not. Randomly assigned to condition, same birthday, math award winner, different birthday, math award winner. They went back, this was October, they went back in June. And look at the grades. And significantly higher math grades in the condition where the math award winner had the same birthday as them. This is so easy to use. There's famous people born on all of our birthdays. You can tell your kids about these, tell the students about them. You know, maybe it even matches up with their interests or something. But to find out, you know, for me, my God, Jimmy Page is born on my birthday. <laughs> hey, how cool am I? You know, it meant a lot to me. It did, it still does. You know, I do it on Facebook. I say, hey, it's Jimmy Page's 75th birthday. And everyone says, yeah, shut up. You're just telling us it's your birthday, so we say happy birthday to you. We know this already. <laughs> But yeah, that may, Richard Nixon is also born on my birthday, so yeah. <laughs> I conveniently forget about that. I'm like, hey, Richard Nixon would have been 100. No. But they really will connect. You know, this is some, oh, sharing a birthday, wow, and wow, and they might you know, really get into it. Maybe it'll be a role model. Maybe it'll be some inspiration. Or their, you know, initials. Or their name. You know, all these things can be played with, but they're very powerful. And also, I think, going back to that Asian-American girl, clearly cultural stereotypes, you have to watch out for those. And emphasizing anything about a person's identity that's deleterious can cause stereotype threat effects and cause decreased performance because when things get tough, they think they can't do it. It's like a genetic thing. That's what happens with girls in math. The uh, girls in science and math uh, classes, the enrollment, when you get to 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, these are grades, I don't know what they correspond to, but basically 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age steadily decrease in girls in the United States because the, the math classes are getting harder. Now they're ta taking algebra and geometry and trigonometry and pre-calc. And as it gets harder, the boys, it gets hard, but they amp up their effort because they don't have this thing, the boys can't do math. I just have to try harder. Girls don't. They don't try harder because girls can't do math. Why should I try harder? I just give up. And they drop out, drop out, drop out, drop out, because it's getting tough, instead of amping up the effort, maybe. Here's some, I just, maybe I'll go through this fairly quickly, but faces are important, too. Faces are, uh, unfortunately, not diagnostic of a person's ability or personality. We think they are. So old man Marley from the Home Alone movie with Macaulay Culkin, you know, the axe murderer burying ba uh, bodies in the basement of the house next door. Turns out to be a sweet old guy, just wants to reconcile with his son and, and grandchild at uh, the Christmas time. Uh, grumpy cat, looks pretty grumpy. Big meme, you know. There's, there's one, I, my favorite one, it says, uh, whatever doesn't kill you, we'll hopefully try again. <laughs> But it's a cat. It's not grumpy. It's not really grumpy. It just looks grumpy. It has a face that's chronic grumpy face, but it's not really grumpy. Really, it's not. I mean, it's just a cat. How can it be grumpy? It's probably having a great life in there. Like, oh, da, da, da. Why is everybody acting that way? Well, you know, poor cat can't get a break. You know, no one trusts it and doesn't like it at all. His name is Kittler. <laughs> But really, we make these judgments of people, and they're so powerful. Alex Todorov at Princeton has done lots of studies showing that, uh, that the, the person's face, how trustworthy and competent people rate a person's face. Even at one-tenth of a second, you get the same ratings as if they have five or six seconds to look at the face. You get the same ratings. One-tenth of a second. We know immediately, trustworthy or competent. Those ratings by people who don't even know these are candidates and, and have nothing to do, these are races uh, for governor and races for Senate, some faraway place. And French people do the ratings for American candidates and vice versa. They don't, they don't know who these people are or anything about their policies. The, the, uh, the judgments of trustworthiness and competence based on their face alone predict 70% of the outcomes of these races. Study after study. So we think we know how that person can be trusted, that person is competent, at least in the United States. Clearly, this is not working. <laughs> we should know this is not working, but we really believe it so strongly that we know, we know this person from their face alone. You don't let their face affect you. 
I had a, my daughter in first grade, uh, uh, I was, they were terrified of the librarian. This old woman, you know, and she's severe looking and they just scared of her. And finally, one day this a librarian came up early in first grade and, and complimented my daughter's boots. Hey, she's just, hey, they were best friends after that. But the initial thing was they, she was so sure this mean, crabby old lady and all that, right? Totally wrong. But your face, you know, so you don't make judgments. Don't, just don't let that happen. Let the child student's behavior make your first impression for you, not not uh, their appearance. Uh, yesterday I gave this talk, uh, a book talk, um, um, Sunday morning, and some people came up afterwards and said, you know, we paid, you know, we bought our tickets, we were up there in the back, and we saw you come out and said, oh no, you know, this guy with a tie, you know, it's gonna be one of these stuffy, boring academic talks, you know, like, oh no. And he said, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was great, you know, and, and uh, I'm not just boasting here, but they, they, they were nice enough to tell me that, but they said the first impression was really awful. <laughs> I gotta, you know, figure this out someday about when to wear one or not. But um, you know, they, they, there was a case of first impressions and how is a stuffy, boring academic talk, um, just because of the tie, right? Just because of the tie. Your face also affects them, though. Uh, I helped out in my daughter's first grade, or maybe it was second grade class, and uh, she just—they were all miserable after kindergarten and first grade. All the kids in her class were miserable. Oh, this student, does, this, this teacher doesn't like us. She's really mean. She's horrible. Well, I was, you know, in the classroom helping a couple of times for the full day, and I, she's a great, she's a great teacher. She was doing fun things. She was you know, helping, supportive. She was a wonderful teacher, and my back was her, to her for the most part with what I was doing, and but I noticed why she never smiled, and these kids, especially at that young age, kindergarten, first uh, grade, five and six years old, they really take that smile as a cue, and she never smiled. But she was, everything else that she was saying and doing was wonderful, but she never smiled. So the kids all thought that she hated them. And it was just her face. Now, physical environment. Because physical environment, we've already seen that with warmth, right? With physical warmth, the physical warmth can activate concepts related to it in a sort of metaphoric way. George Lakoff, if you know this famous book, Metaphors We Live By, 1980. It's all about the, how the physical, our physical experiences activate psychological concepts. And there's so many of them. So distance, you know, we talk about a distant father or a close relationship. We use physical terms to describe relationships. Things that are high, high status, low status. We look up to somebody or we look down on them. We're not really doing that. You know, it's metaphorical. But it's because the first concepts that infants form before they have anything else is spatial. It's about the world, the physical world that they can actually directly experience. And so they have up, down, they have left, right, they have uh, near, far, they have hot, cold, they have hard, soft, soft, uh, uh, rough, smooth, things like that. And since these are the first concepts in their head, they tend to use those. We, t we all tend to use those to describe people. And we talk about a rough interaction. We talk about uh, a hard test. We talk about you know, uh, a hard negotiator. And, and those connections and associations are made early on, and they stay with us the rest of our life so that those physical experiences, like in the case of physical warmth, affect and prime and, and make you more socially warm or, or socially cold or so forth. Um, the high and low is a big one. Uh, if you put a, a, a bunch of um, faces in an array, uh, people will think the ones who are uh, higher up are more moral, are more intelligent, more higher status. We've done studies with negotiation. They sit in a harder, soft chair. They sit in a, a soft chair, they're more compromising. If they're in a hard chair, they take a harder line and they don't give as much in the price negotiation. The physical experiences are causing activation of concepts which are then applied and used in their interaction. Sweetness even works. There's a lot of this. This one I thought, this has gone too far. Even though I do these studies myself, this has gone too far. But the more sweets that people eat during the day, the more sweet behaviors they engage in in these daily diary studies. They're also rated, the more sweets they eat, other people rate their personality, not knowing anything about the candy part, rate them as sweeter people. The more sweets they eat, now sweet foods, uh, sweet candies, whatever. And by sweetness is, you know, a sweet person, right? We know what that is, right? How come we know what that is? It's sweet. Isn't that sweet? They, they know, not that I want to know, but they taste the same as anybody else. You know, it's, it's something about the concept and the pleasantness. 
messy rooms, dirty rooms affect people. So jurors in a dirty room show more moral disgust at the crime and uh, give harsher sentences for the same crime if, and compared if they were in a clean room. So physical disgust translates to moral disgust. And physical disgust experiences affect moral disgust and, and judgments. And so definitely the cleanliness and tidiness of a, of a classroom, orderliness of a classroom compared to disorder. We've already seen that with the graffiti study, right? These things may seem like, who cares? Like, why should they affect? But they do. They do with, in ways that people don't know. The students don't know. They're not, they don't realize this is where their feelings are coming from. And if they did, they could counteract it, but they don't know. And finally, I want to end on this uh, verbal and picture priming. And uh, I'll try to get as much of this in as I can, because there's a lot. Um, but uh, if you want to know more, I'll tell you who the person is and look at their website and read their papers, because this is just outstanding, amazing stuff last eight or nine years or so. Uh, and it's not, I'm not talking about me here. We, we started, this, Peter Goldwitzer and I uh, designed lots of studies to uh, prime motivations, unconscious motivations. How do you do that? By priming. And, and we primed achievement, we primed cooperation and so forth and showed that people were more achieving, got better scores on verbal tasks, and also were more cooperative and more of anything if you prime that with just words in a sneaky way. Like, for example, on a word search task where they're looking for certain words. This is fairly obvious, and there's more subtle ways of doing it. We've used subliminal priming of words. Uh, we've used um, something called a scrambled sentence test where they're exposed to these words. In the actual scrambled sentence test, I'm sorry, this is maybe not so visible, the, the words are not in orange, right? I'm doing that for you, but in the actual one, they're all in the same font, and, and they're not called attention to. But what you do is they're making grammatically correct sentences out of these scrambled up words, uh, word phrases. And so you expose them without their realizing. It's a language test, right? So you can use this in the classroom easily. Uh, but they're exposed to words having to do with certain kinds of behavior or personalities or goals. Uh, this is cooperation. So you see assist, help, together, cooperates, teams are interspersed. And not every single item. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to catch, call their attention to it. But Eight to 10 out of 30, you know, scram, uh, interspersed uh, is fine. Works with any trait, works with any kind of behavior, affects achievement performance, um, uh, affects, as you'll see, uh, even in adults, and even in businesses. Uh, but this is a way, a way to deliver a prime that's very uh, easy. Um, so, for example, uh, we had uh, people play a game where they were uh, uh, a fishing company and another, they were competing against another fishing company uh, to get as much fish as possible. Uh, but if you overfish, you kill the lake and there's no more fish, so you've got to put fish back in to repopulate the lake after each time. The cooperation measures how many fish you put back in. And out of five trials, uh, they caught 15 fish, so they could have put 75 fish back in. But this is the number of fish they put back in. And what it shows is basically we told them to cooperate. We told them it was important. That's the explicit instruction condition. That did increase cooperation, okay, the, the conscious or intentional exhortation. But also the priming of cooperation, just with scrambled sentences, had a separate independent effect to increase cooperation. So there's really the same effect, and they add together. So you can increase cooperation just by words having to do with cooperation. Keep in mind, though, you know, with kids, that bonding and trust is important for cooperation priming, just in that 18-month-old study. Here's another one. This is a, a study Esther Papias does health research. She's at the University of Durham. Has people go into stores and gives them recipe flyers. Well, some of these flyers, or half of them, have words having to do with healthy eating and dieting. And these are obese shoppers that they're studying, uh, eating disorders. And it turns out that if they're exposed to healthy and dieting type words in the recipe flyer at the beginning of the store, they look at their receipt at the end, they buy less, significantly less snack uh, foods at the end. They don't remember the, the recipe flyer. They can't tell you what was on it. But the words triggered the goal that they have, and it affected their shopping throughout the store and showed up on their cash register receipt when they left the store. And they have no awareness or knowledge that the recipe flyer could have caused them. And they would have laughed at you if you told them that that had gone on. A major theory of motivation, and, and you've probably heard of these people, uh, Ed Locke and Gary Latham. Locke and Latham are the researchers in conscious, intentional goal pursuit in motivation in the workplace, or organizational psychologists. They are, it's all about conscious goal pursuit. Nothing happens unconsciously, especially for Ed Locke until the last 10 years, when Gary Latham's student wanted to see if 
the Barge Goldwitzer priming of motivations would work in organizations, he was totally skeptical. He said, go ahead, but it worked. And like the good scientist Gary Latham is, he believed his data and he kept doing more studies and he kept finding it. And now he's giving talks all over the place about how this unconscious uh, motivation effect works in organizations. And I'm going to give you just a little uh, summary of these things because there's so many, but they're so relevant because these are actual organizations where people have the shared goal, just like in the classroom, but also out there in actual businesses in the real world. A, a, call, uh, a call center trying to raise money for a public television station in Canada. If a photograph of a person succeeding high performance, a woman winning a marathon, was in the upper corner compared to a control photograph, over a five-day period, they raise more money, significantly more money for charity, and again, have no clue that, and don't even understand why you would say that that photograph affected how hard they worked. But it did. Just last year, the CEO of a company, a large Southwest United States customer service company, always sends a, a, a Monday morning email. And in this particular week, randomly assigned employees, 23 here and 23 here, to a control condition. In the experimental condition, included words having to do with achievement and high performance, accomplish, strive, achieve, and success. If you're interested, at the end of this slide thing I've got here, I can show you the actual emails. I've got that. But over the next week, that whole week, there was higher performance. The issues were a higher percentage of issues resolved on the very first call, and also the calls, more call, calls were handled by those people if they had that email versus not. In a large Israeli communications company, a goal for effective performance, uh, people uh, answering calls in a friendly way there on the left, they was put on everyone's computer desktops, or at least the control, uh, half of them. The other half had this beautiful tree. That was what they had. So control condition tree, and the other condition had uh, uh, successful uh, customer service representatives. So again, performance was, was higher in the left condition over that day. And given the talk coming up uh, in an hour or so, they did even better if they were given accurate feedback. And they, they even manipulated the feedback in a different experiment where it was terrible. You did terrible. 23% you know, you, rating on your, you know, or 83% rating. It didn't matter. Good or bad feedback both helped a person with an effective goal operating. It did not help at all people with the control condition. But what they really did next from then is give accurate feedback. They actually had the customer ratings after each phone call. And they give accurate feedback. Here's your, your score for the day. And that increased performance even more, but only when they had the effective goal performance primed by that photograph on their computer desktop. Cooperation and teamwork. This is a standard task NASA uses called Lost on the Moon, where there actually is an objective right answer. Your probe vehicle has crashed 100 miles from the mothership. You, have, you can only take certain things. You, you can't take everything. Here are 20 things you could take with you to try to make it to the mothership and rank them in importance. NASA staff have ranked these things so that there's an objective right answer. They have people working on this task as teams. Some of them, they... They prime with a, a group effort here of cooperation and a group effort. They do significantly better in that condition on objective right answers to the lost on the moon task. Uh, even when there's economic incentives built into the experiment for selfish behavior to do something on your own separately from the team, they still they, they don't do that. So it's important. So much of organizational behavior, or organizational uh, corporate work these days is done in teams not as individuals. And this helps people cooperate and get teamwork done even uh, when they have economic incentives to be selfish. So there we are. This is about the minds of the machine, basically how you can use these mechanisms. Just to summarize, I, I started out with mimicry and imitation being important, and so warmth is also to establish trust, to establish a bond of trust, like the Dalai Lama says. That's the bond of friendship and, and so forth is needed for trust, and trust is needed for cooperation, for them to buy in and to share the goal. There's easy ways to do that with paying attention and mimicking, repeating back what the students say, uh, for example. All these different primes are possible. They're all in the book, but they're, they're really, you know, I'm working on another book now all about priming and putting all this just about priming in, a, in a one book. But there's so many and so many ways to deliver it. And, and some of these are so very powerful. And especially verbal and picture priming are so easy to use in classroom materials. All of these goals and more, motivations and more, have been successfully primed and shown to operate in real world settings and corporations and businesses as well as classrooms and lab studies. 
you know, for kids, for students, you could have age-appropriate language games or language tests that deliver these kinds of primes. And that's really the message. The message is all that now is known. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>